Good evening, Forest community members, and I hope you are all well. Welcome to the Trinity Term Series, our focus webinar series. I'm really excited for us to be launching into our third term of these webinar series. The year has really flown. As always, we are not expecting any te technical difficulties, but please do be bear with us if we encounter any problems at all. This webinar this evening will be available from our Forest YouTube page under the tab titled uh, Live in case you'd like to promote it to any other parents or carers or any other members of the forest community. Please do also be kind enough to complete our feedback survey that we'll display at the end in a QR code format, um, as we really do want to hear your feedback and respond to this for future webinars. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer any few questions you have. Therefore, please do add your comments um, and questions in the comment box on the YouTube channel page. And we will try our best to get to as many as possible, but please do understand we've got a limited time uh, this evening. Without further ado, I'd like to give a brief introduction to our speakers this evening. So we have Mrs. Wright, who some of you may well know, and she's our fantastic Head of Learning Support and Director of Academic Progress at Forest. Mrs. Wright oversees the provision for our neurodivergent pupils and ensures that teachers are aware of pupils' differences and diversity and take into consideration this in their, into their teaching. And I work very closely with Mrs. Wright and I feel very honoured. Amanda Gale is a place to be project manager at Forest, another valued member of our community and oversees a whole school service supporting counsellors to deliver therapeutic support to pupils, providing a range of interventions, including one-to-one -one counselling and group work and supporting teachers, parents and carers and the school as a whole. Again, a very valued member of our community, and I actually don't know how she does it. Julia Clements is an educational psychologist at Place to Be, and her key one, one of her key roles, she has many, is to work with counsellors and school staff to identify and support the needs of children and young people with SEND needs who may also have mental health needs. And I've worked with uh, Dr. Julia Clements directly with um, her supporting training with our heads of house team. And again, uh, we are very, very incredibly lucky to have her as part of the extended forest community. So without further ado, over to our established guests and very, very well versed speakers. I'm going to first of all hand over to um, Mrs. Wright. Hello, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our talk on supporting the mental health of neurodivergent children. So I'm going to start tonight by explaining um, some of the provision that we have at Forest for our, our pupils and also just to delve into um, neurodiversity a little bit and what that means. So uh, at Forest, we have 15 percent or 180 pupils with a diagnosed need. Um, we do have a lot of pupils who are uh, showing signs of neurodiversity, but may not have a diagnosis. 15% uh, is in line with most state schools, slightly higher than the 12% in independent schools. And that's probably because we are an extremely large independent school of 1500 pupils. So what types of uh, SEND need do we have at Forest? You might be familiar with some of these terms, and this is just um, sort of a, a, a few of the ones that we experience. Most commonly, probably dyslexia, um, but also we have ADHD, dyscalculia, dys uh, dysgraphia, a whole range of, of different needs. And um, Nowadays, most of these needs are what we call comorbid in that they exist alongside one another. Um, I think it's also worth saying that um, each uh, person is an individual and they may experience or express these needs in different ways. So overall, neurodivergent pupils share one or more four core deficits. As you can see, there, there's a lot of different uh, types of uh, special educational needs and neurodiversity. And as teachers, it's, it's impossible to be experts in every single need. So really, it's good to kind of think about them in four areas. And if, if you're thinking about them with these four areas, then you're likely to be be able to support the pupils and children in terms of what they do. So the four core deficits for neurodiversity are 
poor phonological processing, poor working memory, slow processing speeds and social communication difficulties. And I'm just going to go through each of those very quickly so that you've just got an understanding of what that looks like. So poor phonological processing. So the phonological processing is a, is a time it takes to see a shape, say letter of the alphabet, to understand that that shape is a letter, to give a sound to it. So for example, A would be A, and then to put that into context of reading. So if you do have something like dyslexia or a slow processing speed with phonological awareness, you will take a little bit longer to recognize the letter and put it to a sound and to put it into um, reading, in which case your reading um, can become a bit slower. So that is an underlying deficit or need in, in neurodiverse children. Um, it also affects your sounds and listening to sounds. So if a teacher is talking and you don't always recognize different sounds in words, then you can misunderstand a word. And this becomes pretty evident in exams quite often, as that's where uh, pupils are faced with unfamiliar language. So phonological re uh, processing and awareness is really important in being able to read fluently and to be able to understand text very quickly. The second area of need in uh, neurodivergent pupils is poor working memory. So working memory is your memory in the moment and it's the ability to hold and manipulate a piece of information. So it's what you can, you're doing at the present. And um, this can often sort of show itself in lots of different ways. Um, so in, in class, this can appear as difficulties with attention, zoning out, following instructions, slow to progress. And even at home, you might experience that you've asked um, your son, daughter to go and do a set of tasks and they've forgotten them by the time they've gone upstairs or they only remember the last task and don't remember the list. So working memory is really, really important in helping children to be grounded and to be able to feel like they can access education. The third um, area of, of or deficit, really, that's quite often prevalent in neurodivergent children is slow processing speeds. So we get all of our information either through what we see or what we hear, and we output it at school particularly through um, what we say or what we write. So if any of those four um, processes there is, is slightly slower, that means that you will be behind in either taking in information or producing information. And, and quite a lot of our neurodivergent children struggle with the pace of lessons. And, and by that, I mean keeping up with the speed of what is going on. And that can make them feel like they haven't got it or they feel uncomfortable and um, can be a real hindrance for their development. Um, and the fourth area that's quite common in neurodiversity is um, social communication difficulties. And that can be issues around reading social cues, understanding nuances, reading facial expressions uh, and self-regulation. It's just not reading the room, understanding what needs to happen, understanding how to react. And this uh, for a lot of children can be quite challenging, um, especially as school coming to be a very emotional place. Um, and often find that, you know, they can go from zero to 100 very quickly. Um, a lot of children as well are very good at sort of containing it at school. And then you might find that they have those sort of outbursts at home or, or they're a different child at home because they are trying to conform to what is going on at school so hard that when they get home, they need to, a safe space to kind of express themselves. So those are the four areas that I spend a lot of time talking to our teachers about and looking at in terms of how we would support um, our pupils with the these kind of neurodivergent needs. So pupils at Forest um, are given a pupil passport. This is Harry Potter's, it's just an example for you. But what we try and do is inform teachers to um, have strategies to use with that particular child based around their needs. And so these things are given to teachers alongside uh, lots of training and, and, and conversations that we have to help and try and support um, a, a neurodivergent child to access a really archaic system of education, uh, which they will often struggle with. 
Um, there's lots and lots of ways to support and, you know, often we, we try lots of different methods. I think the best person to actually help us with these sort of uh, strategies is the pupil themselves. They know what works for them. They know how, how to uh, find and navigate their way through school. Um, and quite often, sometimes, you know, these sort of needs do not come to a head until much later in, in their um school career and that's often because they are bright their underlying ability is very good it's not a reflection of their intellect it's a, a really a reflection of how they access their intellect and our job is to to try and help them access that intellect in the best possible way um I just thought this might be helpful to think about, but children are born with brains that think, learn and process information differently than others. And we need to provide um, opportunities for them to succeed. As I, as I mentioned, the education system is very traditional and it's not really set up for neurodivergent pupils. And so, you know, in order to promote self-esteem and to make them feel valued, they need to be able to feel they can achieve. And if they have those core deficits and they are struggling with processing and working memory, they can often feel that they, they're not good enough or they don't succeed. And actually that's the wrong message for them because we want them to feel that they can succeed because that in underlying ability is very strong. Um, I spoke to some of our lovely neurodivergent uh, pupils at Forest and I thought I'd just share some of their comments about Forest and how we support. Um, so one people said, almost everyone I know has been super accepting of my accommodations. So many students and teachers are really interested to learn more about it. People can do, do is research about autism and neurodiversity, get your information from neurodivergent people. We have lived, life, lived experience so we can get the most accurate account of what is new being neurodivergent is. And um, I've learned to accept my strengths and weaknesses. Um, some really positive, powerful, um, comments there and I you know I'm really privileged to work in a school that is so inclusive and is so forward-looking in in promoting these neurodiverse um, strategies to support our pupils so I hope that that gives you a little bit of an understanding of what we do at Forest um, I'm going to pass over now to Amanda who I work very closely with at Place to Be um, because often um, neurodiversity um, and self-esteem are so closely linked um, you know we, we work very closely to try and promote that self-esteem for children so I'm going to hand over now to Amanda. Hello everybody thank you for joining us this evening and thank you Mrs Wright. Um, so my name is Amanda Gale I'm the school project manager for Place to Be here at Forest we're a children's mental health charity and I'm going to tell you about how our one-to-one -one counselling sessions, how we adapt them for children with neurodivergence. Um, so one-to-one -one counselling sessions, we do require parental consent. Um, I also offer a lunchtime drop-in service. Um, pupils can self-refer to that. It's called Place to Talk. Um, and we're on site five days a week. So there's myself and a team of counsellors providing a range of services to the whole of the school community. Um, and I've just put my email address there in case anyone would like to get in touch and ask any questions or any, anything you'd like to find out. So supporting neurodivergent pupils at Forest, um, as Mrs Wright said, we work really closely with one another, um, which is so helpful because we can identify between us uh, students that might be appropriate for one-to-one -one counselling. And we'd always start with a place to be assessment to, to really find out about, um, about that child, well, what are their needs, how do they work? Um, and that's where the pupil passports are really, really helpful. So I'm able to, to, to see those for each individual child and that can inform how we run the counselling sessions. Um, also working with parents, you are the experts on your children and it's really good to find um, ways to communicate with your children. You, you, you'll know the things that work, the things that, that don't work. So we would really hope that you would be fully on board. And then probably most importantly is, is pupil voice. What, what do they need? What do they want? How, how, do, how do they work? 
and as Mrs. Wright said, they can sometimes find um, the school day really, really overwhelming. And these are some of the things they tell us about sensory overload, how busy the school is, the sounds, the smells, transition between classes, lunch, break and games can be really, really tricky to manage. And unpredictability. And of course, most, most events are timetabled, lessons are timetabled, but there's always going to be things that, that crop up out of the blue. And some children find that really, really difficult to manage and it can make them feel out of control and then this in turn feeds into their self-esteem and they can start to feel really really badly about themselves so it's in terms of adapting the counseling environment place to be is really skilled at this we work really closely with each child we know we know that one size doesn't fit all and we would work really really hard to build a relationship with your child to work out how, how, how they work what do they need and we might consider sort of language and, and meaning here because it can be different for neurotypical children than it is to neurodiverse children. Um, we want to really make sure that they're understand we're understanding one another. Um, sometimes children respond much better to visual content and we use whiteboards and magnets and uh, resources within the room that can, that can really help. Their special interests, these can be really, really useful as a way of engaging with children. Um, they're, mu they're much more likely um, to engage and want to change their, their behaviours and look at their, their feelings if they're perhaps relating it to their favourite, I don't know, Marvel superhero or whatever it is that they're really into. So we really use those to inform um, the, the therapy sessions and get them on board. And some children struggle with, with light and sound and noise and we do what we can within the therapy room to make it really comfortable for them. Do we turn the lights off? Do they need a blanket? What, what, what's, what's going to work for you here? Um, and we've also mentioned how difficult transition is for, for some pupils. So we work really hard to make sure that their transition back to class or to games or to lunch from the therapy session is as smooth as it can be. We need to give them time to, um, to sort of resettle, re, to re-emerge back into the, into the school day. Um, we need to really make sure that place to be is the right intervention um, for the children. And this, again, this is where Mrs. Wright and I will work really closely together. And, and if it's not, then we would think about signposting on to, to a different um, agency. And what we're looking for um, in the children is, do, do they notice that there's something they'd like to change? Are they aware of the challenges? Are they hopeful for some change? Do they, do they wish to engage? We would never want to force a child to attend if, if they didn't really want to. And for some children with, with neurodivergence, it's really anxiety provoking, meeting new, new people. The thought of change can be really, really daunting. So again, this is where we work really hard to get to know your child, provide the rationale for why, why are they having these therapy sessions? And um, you know, they're not just being sort of plucked out of, of, of class for no reason. Let, let's get them on board. What, what goals do you want to work towards? What would you like to change? And this can really help reduce the anxiety when you manage the expectations in that way. The same with planning and celebrating endings. Let, let them know what's happening. Let them adjust to, to an ending coming up. They, they tell us that they really find that helpful because they don't, they don't like short, sharp changes. Um, and the place to be service is really well promoted in school by staff so both the one-to-one -one sessions and the place to talk sessions i mentioned earlier and it might be actually that a child attends place to talk a couple of times and i get to know them a little bit and then i might have a conversation with with mrs Wright. we might think actually i wonder if we if we could support this child further here with their with their emotional well well-being so that's just a little rundown of, of how we how we work here at, at place to be and I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Julia Clements, who, again, I work very closely with our principal place to be educational psychologist. Thank you, Amanda. That's great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about how you can support um, your child at home, because as you can hear from Mrs. Uh, Wright and, and from Amanda, you know, the, the children have a very, very busy and full and challenging um, day at school. And I expect that sometimes when they when they come home, um, you know, you're, you're, you're picking up on that. And it's important that you're able to understand and support um, your child. 
it was really clear to me since I started working uh, with the staff at Forest that, you know, pupil voice is really important. You know, I've heard that from what Mrs. Wright has, has, has just presented just now and Amanda too. And here's some um, more feedback from um, <clears throat> a researcher called Victoria Bourne. Um, and she asked autistic girls what it's like for them at school. And it was so great to hear when Mrs. Wright was um, saying, actually, if you want to know what it's like, if you're a neurodivergent uh, student at school, well, then ask us because we have that best lived experience. So, for example, one, one person told the, the researcher, I got told off for not listening. I was, but looking into people's eyes makes me feel uncomfortable. So there's that difference between um, if you're predominant neurotype um, and if you're neurodivergent, there's a difference, for example, in how you use things like eye contact. So if you're of the predominant neurotype, you might think, OK, um, I expect people to look at me and that indicates that they're listening to me. And in fact, that's that's not actually the case, is it? it you, you can listen to someone without actually uh, looking directly into their eyes. So we can adjust for things like that in school and it's important that we do so. Another student said, for me, school was for learning. Rewards for other pupils felt like punishments for me. So again, if we think about what's rewarding for a lot of children, young people, predominant neurotype children, young people, they might be things like having extra playtime, extra social time, extra free time. Actually, for your neurodivergent child, that might actually feel quite stressful. Um, and they might prefer because, you know, the social demands of those time may actually be quite high for them. And they might prefer to do something individual um, or engage in their special interest um, or, or do a preferred activity. It's true to say that, um, you know, when, when we look at the research more widely, some neurodivergent children can feel that their, um, you know, the environment really isn't set up for them, the physical environment, the emotional environment, the social environment. And this next quotation really illustrates that. A child said, a lot of the time we look at the neurotypical person as a bully. It's understandable because whether they know it or not, they're forcing us into a box that we simply were not meant to fit in. So, you know, because schools and, and classrooms and playgrounds are often um, set up by people who are of the predominant neurotype, people who aren't autistic, don't have dyslexia, don't have any experience of ADHD and so on. We're not actually building necessarily and creating the right sorts of environments for our neurodivergent students at school. So as has been um, referred to, um, our children who are neurodivergent, during the school day, they can experience sensory overload. If, you, if you've been in school recently, you know they're very busy places. They smell, you know, really strongly of cooking, for example, or plimsolls if the children have been doing PE. Um, you know, they're bright places. Um, they can, you know, be, be a place where a lot, is, a lot is going on. And if you're neurodivergent and have sensory differences, you can experience that in real sort of overload. It feels like it's just too much. The social demands of school can feel really, really um, high for our neurodivergent children as well. So things like group work, okay? we, we often encourage children to get into pairs or small groups. And we that's an important skill to have, of course. But actually, if you're neurodivergent and have social differences in how you interact with others, then that in itself could become a bit more of a demand, a bit more of a challenge, if you like, than the actual task, the actual learning task that the teacher has set. And that fear of being socially rejected or indeed bullied. And neurodivergent children can spend a lot of their school day trying really hard to understand other people, both the staff and their peers, trying to get uh, the jokes, trying to get the nuances, trying to pick up on those social subtle um, cues. Um, expectations for learning, they can be um, very different according for teacher to teacher um, and very difficult, especially for our children, young people who perhaps have 
dys, um, dyscalculia, dyslexia, ADHD, and so on. And that coping with unpredictability and change that Amanda made reference to. Schools are places of constant change. Um, we're always on to the next thing. We try and keep the pace of learning up and, and, and so on. So that, that can be an extra challenge and that sense of feeling out of control. So what can happen for our children and young people is that they can seem to have that constant sense of not quite meeting other people's expectations. And that's obviously going to have an effect on their mental health and well-being. And someone has captured this in a really useful analogy. And this is something that you might actually use with your child or your young person. And it's kind of the idea of the Coke bottle effect is that when you're at school or indeed in another situation, you might find quite challenging. It's like having a Coke bottle. And it's not necessarily one thing that becomes overwhelming for a child or young person, although it can be. It's often the build up of many shakes of the Coke bottle. So I've given some examples here and your child might be able to perhaps draw a, a Coke bottle and illustrate for them the sorts of things that kind of shake their bottle throughout the day. So things like moving around in a noisy corridor, um, being in a lesson where there's strong cooking smells, trying to study when there's very strong, harsh, strict lighting, being encouraged to um, engage in group work, or if your uniform feels very tight, if you've got a child with sensory needs, their collar and their tie might feel very, almost as if it's choking them. And yet, if you've got another child who's of the predominant neurotype, they don't even think about their school uniform. Sitting down for too long, so if you've got a child with ADHD, um, it might be that they find it difficult to sit too long, so that's going to shake their Coke bottle, not understanding a joke, having a supply teacher and so on. So that might be something that you want to take from this um, presentation this evening. You might want to have a conversation with your child or young person, draw a Coke bottle and say, what is it that, that shakes you throughout the day? Give me an idea. And if they can share that with their teachers, that would be really helpful too. Because we know that if you shake a bottle of Coke and continue to do that, at one point, the lid is likely to fly off. So those reactions to high levels of stress might be that they don't actually happen within the school day. It might be that you're experiencing your child and, the, and their reactions to high levels of stress once they get home. It might be that they come home very, very tired. They might go into shutdown. And that's a kind of internalizing reaction where your child might need to go and lie in their bed, have some time away from the family, um, you know, and that might be different from a, your other child, especially if you have other children who are of the predominant neurotype. They might want to reconnect with the family. They might come out to school very busy and chatty. But understanding that your neurodivergent child might need some time to just shut down, to rest and recuperate. Alternatively, it might be that your neurodivergent child actually goes into meltdown when they come home. And that's a more externalized reaction to stress. So your child might um, seem to be um, you know, very behaviorally activated. So they might um, throw things. They might um, seem quite argumentative. They might cry. Um, you know, that, that idea that they've been, you know, that Coke bottle has been shaken all day and then it all comes out at home in a very external way, in a way that you can see and it has an effect on you and the family and, and so on. Some of our children, especially those with ADHD, um, parents often describe their child as kind of tired but wired. So they know that they should be winding down at the end of a busy school day, but they're still wired, they're still on the go. And that can make things like bedtimes very challenging. And if you have an autistic child or young person at home, um, you can think about that in terms of autistic fatigue or burnout. So there's an appreciation that many of your children will have kind of kept things together with the support that they get from the, the staff at Forest all day. Very demanding um, school environment um, you know, because of all those things I've listed. And then when they come at home, back home, you, you get that sort of fallout, those reactions to high levels of stress. 
So how can you help? Now, the number one thing that I think it's really important for parents to do is to think about their own reactions first. And we often call this the, the oxygen mask principle. So the idea is like, just like when you're on a plane and they say the first thing you must do is put on your own oxygen mask first, and then you're going to be more helpful to those around you. Because when your child is very um, anxious, when they're stressed, or when they're low or whatever um, emotional state they're in, you need to make sure that you're OK and then you're in a better place to regulate your child. So do kind of check in with yourself, because especially when your child is anxious or stressed, one of the first things we can do is become anxious or stressed ourselves. So a key thing you can do is to make sure that your child feels loved, they feel valued, and they feel accepted. And that, because Amanda was talking about self-esteem, it's really important that children feel loved and valued and accepted for who they are. Now, if you feel loved and valued and accepted for who you are, you're more likely to enjoy a, a healthy level of good self-esteem. Because often we can give children the message completely inadvertently that what we value about them is what they achieve, what they do well at. So I'm not saying that you don't praise your child if they do something well or do well in a test or a, a sports performance or whatever. However, how they um, feel that they're loved is kind of despite all of those things, not because of all those things. So they have your love they're valued and they're accepted uh, despite um, you know, the, their achievements. So really thinking about how can you give your child that, that message. Another thing you can do is to really try and help your child to recognise and understand their emotional state. Now for our neurodivergent children, especially if you've got an autistic child, um, it might be that that's you know, how, how they feel on the inside is a bit of a mystery. We can see that they're, you know, in their level of distress because of their behaviour, what you see at home, the meltdown, the shutdown, the refusal and so on. But can your child actually get in touch with their, um, with their emotional state, with their feelings, what's going on for them? So here's something else that you can do. We talked about the Coke bottle earlier. And here's something else that you could do with your child or young person. And if you need any more help with this, um, then Amanda will be able to go through this with you. So when there's a, a difficult time in your, in your child's life or a triggering moment, um, it can be helpful to help them to identify their thoughts. So what sorts of thoughts are going on for them at those times? And then help them to identify their feelings you might have to sort of second guess at some of those in the first instance. Um, you know, be curious about what sorts of feelings might be going on. Um, you say, oh, I, I can see that you're hiding under the bed or, or whatever it is. I'm wondering whether you're a bit scared. So rather than interpreting the behaviour as a kind of defiance, get curious about what sorts of feelings might be um, feeding into that behaviour. Another really important thing to do is to help your child get in touch with what's going on in their body. So, for example, you know, your child might, um, you might encourage them to put their hands on their heart, especially if you, your, your guess is that they're feeling quite anxious or nervous or worried. Do they realise that their heartbeat has perhaps increased? Perhaps they can feel their face and think, oh, yes, my cheeks are getting a, a little bit hot. Perhaps they have a bit of a, a headache, like a tension headache. Perhaps they've realised that their fists are getting tight. All of these things will help them get in touch with, oh, this is anxiety showing up for me, or, oh, this is my low mood, or these are my worries, or, or whatever it is. And then the behaviour will make sense. Right? It might be that you just want to try that for yourself. So identify a situation that perhaps you found a little bit um, stressful and identify what thoughts went through your mind what feelings arose, <clears throat> what went on in your body and how you actually behaved. As I say, do, do ask um, Amanda if you want any more um, help with that sort of um, way of helping your child think about what's going on for them. Really important that you practice emotional regulation techniques and 
really fabulous if you can be that great role model and actually practice them alongside your child. So you're not giving them the message that, you know, it's only them that gets drowned or, you know, experience low mood or experience meltdowns or shutdowns, that actually you, perhaps to a lesser extent, but you, you, you experience those things too. You might have a very busy day at work or um, you might be feeling cross about something that's been said in the family. You can name it. We often say, you know, name it to tame it. So that can be a, a good one. You can say, what is this feeling? Oh, this is me. I'm feeling really grumpy. I'm fed up. What's going to help me? So you're modelling to your child that you can recognise your feeling, you can name it, but then do something about it. So here there's just an illustration of um, perhaps this is a dad or an uncle or an older brother taking their uh, child for a run. That might be something that they need to do to kind of, you know, shake off the, the stress. Or here's a parent, an older sister, whoever that is, with another child. And they're just having a moment of perhaps mindfulness, perhaps they're listening to calm music but find what helps regulate you and your child. You might even consider the use of a calm box. So this is a, a box or a bag of things that you know really help your child to get regulated. Simple things. So as you can see in this box, there's a teddy. So it might be that your child wants a bit of a hug. Um, there's a little bottle and in that bottle are bubbles. So it might be that your child um, blows out bubbles because when you increase the out breath, it can help bring down, uh, slow down your breathing, bring down uh, blood pressure and so on. There's making pom-poms. So doing something very repetitive can be soothing and so on. But think about um, what a box, what, what could be in your child's box and they could use that. Um, so again, practice those things together and then they might be able to use their box um, without you even even being there. Or they might want to use that box when they first get in from school. Amanda mentioned those difficulties with transitions. So it might be that's the first thing they do. So instead of having lots of talk about their school day, they might just want to go to their calm box, have a moment, get regulated before they're ready to engage with the rest of the, the evening. Especially if your child is, is doing lots of worry that goes round and round and round. Um, you know, that sort of worry that, um, yeah, that seems to not not leave your leave your mind, perhaps you experience it yourself. Um, help your child to problem solve. Um, and one way you might do this is to think about using different post-it notes, for example. And they can write down all their worries on different post-it notes. And then you can say, OK, well, there, there are some of these things that you can do something about, you know. And there's some of these things that perhaps someone at school could help you with. Or actually, it's for them to worry about, so let's put those in a different pile. And actually, some of these mm -hmm. things are for me and your dad or me and your granny or whoever to, to worry about. They're, they're, they're the grown-up things. We need to take that away from you. So helping your child to problem-solve and reminding them of how they have problem-solved in the past can be quite empowering for your child. So especially when they feel like they're ruminating, that going over and over, or they don't, you know, they feel overwhelmed and, and disempowered, you know, everything's too much, then helping them write them down. Again, it's that name it to tame it idea. Write things down, and then we can put those things in different parcels. And sometimes literally taking some of those post-its away from your child to say, these are my things to worry about, aren't they really? Let me take those from you. So that the number of worries get reduced and they can just focus on the ones that actually there is something they can do about. Helping your child to keep things in balance as well. Um, working out, um, sometimes this is called energy accounting. So there might be some things that are real drains on your child and other things that are radiators. So things that kind of really feed them and nurture them and make them feel good and other things that are very, very draining. And that will be very different. So you might have one of your children, for example, might love social things, loves going out to parties, loves being part of um, sports and games and teams and so on. And your neurodivergent child might not. That might actually feel quite draining for them. So find out what actually drains them and what brings them joy and nurture and what sort of feeds them. 
very individual, as I say. What's important for your, chest, your child to rest and uh, recharge? What helps them to relax and building those things into the evening and to the weekends? Allowing enough time for physical activity that's perhaps not part of an organised sports activity, but just being physical for the sake of it, going out on a bike ride, going off on their skates, um, skateboard, whatever it is for your, for your child, swinging on a tree. You know, those lovely big body motions and sensations that can make us feel really um, energised or really relaxed. Stimming. So those are the repetitive movements, especially if your child's autistic, they may um, not necessarily stim at school, but actually the research indicates that that repetitive movement, perhaps it's a, a hand flap, something like that, um, can actually be quite soothing and regulating for your child. So making sure that that's absolutely OK and they can they can do that, of course, and allowing for ticks. So if your child um, has Tourette syndrome or has some ticks, repetitive movements, just allowing for those and not, not bringing any um, attention to those. So really, this is all about creating places and spaces where they can really be their true selves. So once you've done some of these activities, perhaps bring them together, make a, a, a list or a toolkit um, of something that you know really helps your, your child. Um, it could be good to perhaps even write this up or encourage your child to have a list on their phone because when you're in the middle of feeling stressed or distressed or overwhelmed or in the middle of meltdown, it's very difficult to think. You'll know yourself if you're parenting a neurodivergent child. If you try and reason with them in the moment, that's really, really difficult. But if you've already got your list and it's up on the fridge door, or on the bedroom door or on their phone, wherever it is, you've got your calm box in place or your diagram of the Coke bottle or they've got their diagram of their thoughts, feelings, behaviours or they've got their list of things that make them feel good. So they go to that and eventually they'll find those strategies that work for them. So make that plan. Um, and share it with others. It, it can be really useful to share um, what seems to work at home uh, with, with school staff, um, things that are important to your child, um, things that they need to have to have a good day, um, how staff can know what's happening for your child when they're struggling, how does that show up uh, for your child, what helps and what doesn't help because both you and the school staff are, are working hard to try and understand your child and, and trying to make the environment, the physical environment, the social environment, the emotional environment as um, adapted as it can be for your child. But that takes some, some working out and there'll be a work in progress. But keep up that communication. Certainly my experience of working with the staff at Forest is that they're really, really keen to get it right. For, for children, especially for neurodivergent children. If you're still concerned, make sure you do go into, um, into school um, and, and speak to staff, speak to Amanda. You can um, also seek help from your GP and really make sure you do look after your own mental health. It's really difficult if you think that your child is struggling to, to you know, um, Focus on your own needs as well, but that is important. So do remember that oxygen mask principle too. And in terms of books that are written by children and young people or young adults who have lived experience of neurodivergence, these, these are some um, books I particularly like and that I go to. So anything written by Alice Rowe is great. Um, she's a, um, an autistic adult and she really explains what anxiety is like when you're autistic. My Non-Identical Twin is by um, a young author called Evie Meg, and um, she has Tourette Syndrome. So it can be really good for, um, you know, finding out from the inside, what's it like to have Tourette Syndrome, especially as a girl. M is for Autism. That's a book written by uh, the girls at Limpsville Grange, which is the only state school in the UK for girls who are autistic. Um, and they write fantastic novels with with autistic girls right in the center so they're the protagonists and anything by Libby Scott again she's a young autistic girl but there'll be loads more but um you know helping your child to realize that they're not they're not the only one there are other children young people like them um and yeah getting getting that sense that they're they're not alone 
Okay, I think we've got about 45 minutes left now. Um, and Mrs. Wright is going to um, have a look and see if anyone's made any comments um, or um, asked any questions. And we can certainly do our best to, um, you know, try and answer those if, if we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. That was so informative and helpful, hopefully, for our parents. And thank you to Amanda. And I know we work very closely together all the time, but it's really helpful just to go through the, what place to be is and how it provides support. Um, I think it's actually 15 minutes we've got left, not not 45. So um, that's OK. Uh, so do feel free if you have any questions while we're all here and available to you um, to pop them into the comments and um, we will try and answer them. I just wanted to uh, perhaps finish with something about um, the parent school network and support system. So. Um, you know, it's really important for us to have a really clear partnership with with home. And I think one of the things that can be quite difficult is is how your, your child presents at home is very often very difficult to how that ch child presents at school. Um, as you've heard tonight, there is a lot of provision at school. There's a lot of goodwill, a lot of support. And perhaps one of the challenges that I know Amanda and I face is children not wanting to engage with that support and part of that is that they want, don't want to be seen to be different they don't want to be seen to be singled out um, and what we would really encourage you as parents to do is to try and talk to them about the support and and talk to them about how they can engage with things at school. Um, we do have a very different relationship with your children than you do, obviously. And sometimes we can be more persuasive in terms of, uh, of getting them to engage. But we want children to want to, to be helped and want to actually engage with what we have. Um, and I know that's really important for, for place to be as well, Amanda, isn't it? In terms oh, of what they yeah. need to do. Absolutely. I, I would, um, you know, we, we really want the children to be engaged, for it to be meaningful for them. And I think a way parents can help is to talk really positively about mental health support, um, but also just bearing in mind that it does need to be their decision. So sometimes it's like a little bit of a drip feed effect, but just keep giving the message that, you know, this support is available to you and normalise it. You know, everybody has... Um, anxiety and, and low mood and uh, at any time in their in their life they're, they're not different in that sense I think sometimes neurodivergent children feel that they're so different that this is just another difference they have but actually is, there are many children that that, that would benefit from from counseling and then, and I think another thing to remember is that if your child is in one-to-one -one counseling sessions um, and we've had the assessment and everything and I've got to know you as a parent a little bit um, we, we can have further conversations. That's really, really useful. It's, it's useful for me to hear about what's going on at home, any differences, any changes, and also for me to feed back how your child sessions are going and things that might work at home. So we can work together to really, really su support your child. Yeah, thank you. And I, we had a question there about what if your child doesn't want to engage. I think you just highlighted some key principles there about drip feeding and normalizing it. I think the other thing to stress is the confidentiality nature of what we do. And we certainly don't go around, you know, proclaiming what children have or need. Um, we leave it very much up to the child to, to disclose any support they might have. Um, and teachers are fully aware as well that they are not to sort of reveal anything that, that might cause embarrassment or make the child feel awkward. Um, but I think it is really important that because we have so much on offer that children do feel like they can be part of that and feel like they can engage with that. So drip feeding is definitely a way forward and even small steps and giving them some options of different things they might like to try. I think also quite often having a good conversation with a child when they're not in a heightened state so you know wait perhaps going for a walk or some of the strategies that um julia has mentioned is a is a good chance to actually talk rationally about what needs to happen um i would say it's the worst time to approach a child when they're actually in a heightened state and say you need this or you need to do that um you know, trying to find an activity where you can be relaxed and talking about other things, 
and maybe even given examples of perhaps in your own life where you've had support and it's helped you in some way or another is also another strategy that could be used. Um, we've had another question. Uh, is there provision opportunity for neurodiverse kids to le lean on each other for peer support, especially when they're right at the beginning of the journey? I think this is referencing probably mentoring or maybe an older older pupil mentoring or talking to a younger pupil. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we're really keen to do. We have to obviously find the right children that are going to connect well together uh, and who are actually have got similar traits. And, and again, that needs to come a little bit from the child because while we set that up, it's important that the child wants to, to be part of that and to listen to that. But I think that lived experience of someone older um, supporting someone who's younger is, is invaluable. And often children will listen more to peers or, or other young people than they will to adults generally. Um, I don't know if Julie, you wanted to add in anything there about mentoring as a, as a form of support. Yes, mentoring in school, but that sort of idea of finding your tribe is really important, isn't it? That, Sometimes we talk about the, the kind of double empathy problem um, that you don't get me and I don't get you. But actually, when neurodivergent children um, and young people get together, they often do get each other. So that idea of finding your tribe is really good within school, but also outside of school. So any parents or carers listening to this thinking, you know, how can I get my child to connect you know, with other, someone else who's got a similar interest or someone else who has similar challenges or differences. I'd, I'd really, really encourage that. I think it's important, of course, to, to be friends with um, children of the predominant neurotype too. But yeah, finding your tribe, finding somebody who's, who's seen it, done it, they've had that sort of experience can be such a relief for children. And I, I, I'm not sure if a lot of parents are aware but we were in an independent school so sometimes some of the things that are on offer to other um, parents in in our boroughs are not obviously um, necessarily readily available to us but what I could in or should encourage you really is if you go to your local borough website you can find type in send support and they would have a local offer so every every borough will have a local offer i.e they will offer support for neurodivergent uh, children and you can tap into some of the support groups and websites and things that are going on in your borough which again might give you some other outlets to encourage your children to meet others that are similar uh, or at least other parents with children of um, similar needs and I think from parents there you know unfortunately there isn't a guidebook or a manual on how to parent so it you know it's very very challenging and and can be even more so if you have a neurodivergent child so um, I would encourage you to if you get a chance go on google type in your local authority and go and check out the local offer in your in your borough because you might surprise be surprised with what's available around you um, so yeah, the pupil passport, somebody's asked about the pupil passports that we produce. Um, yes, they, they are available to parents. We like to think of them very much as a fluid um, piece of work, really. They're not set in stone because children change and children develop as they as they grow through through forests. So um, we they are available, um, but we want to be making sure that they're up to date as possible. So they do get reviewed regularly. And we do actually go into lessons to check that teachers are using those strategies and to chat to teachers about whether they are the right strategies for, for that child. Um, and it, and there can be quite a helpful way of just trying to get the child to understand as well what the, what the teacher's doing so for a lot of children we talk about we ask them what they want to happen um because that's their voice as well being heard to the teacher so that that is very important as well um yes amanda uh, can i just add something else? i'm just thinking about engagement of children um and in encouraging them. I, I mentioned before that I also run a place to talk service, which um, it could be like a little bit of a gateway. I think for children who are really resistant, sometimes it's nice just to come up to place to be, just to meet me for 10 minutes, 
do a bit of myth busting um and that, that can be a really useful way just to start to build a relationship because i think sometimes young people think oh my goodness counseling sessions 10 10 weeks no no thank you but just to, just as a little introduction it might be worth saying why, why don't you just make a place to talk session it's, it's only 10 minutes you know they don't have to commit to anything but that that can be a way to to sort of help form form a relationship and to encourage engagement lovely um thank you so much julia thank you amanda for for being here tonight and i hope that some of those uh these pieces of information have been really helpful to parents um and have a good evening thank you thank you bye bye, bye. bye. Thank you.